Holding Court with Ebony K. Williams cross-examines newsmaking cases and famous faces to peer into the court of law. Each week, attorney Ebony K. Williams and cultural observer Dustin Ross break down what's on the docket in American justice and what's not, with savvy legal analysis and common sense commentary to provide teachable moments for us all to navigate a rigged system. Now, obviously, the discussions in this podcast shouldn't be considered legal advice, but they offer great general advice and entertainment. Each episode is different, and the topics span to what legal jargon means, history, social injustice, and even pop culture events like Kelly Clarkson's divorce or R. Kelly's trial. Holding Court is hosted by Ebony K. Williams, who's an attorney, author, activist, TV host, and a former public defender. She's back with a second season to give you raw, real, and completely unfiltered commentary on how the law affects us. Listen to Holding Court with Ebony K. Williams on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Y'all know we love asking questions. Who did it? Why did they do it? And can we watch another episode? Now you can take your love of true crime to the screen with Topic. Topic's streaming service has critically acclaimed true crime docuseries as well as scripted shows inspired by real events, featuring North American premieres, exclusive TV series and film, and programming from more than 40 countries. Topic showcases an unparalleled collection. Currently in my queue, Catching a Killer and Dark Woods. Catching a Killer gives viewers unprecedented behind-the-scenes access to real-life homicide investigations. Each episode covers one major crime investigation from start to finish. Raw and voyeuristic, only true crime fans need apply. Dark Woods is inspired by a real-life case that follows a police officer's three-decade search for his missing sister. You have tons of streaming services to choose from, but Topic is the home for a range of high quality true crime shows just for you. And you can get all of this for the low price of $5.99 a month. Topic is the streaming service you need if you are a true crime fan. Entertain your dark side. Right now, Topic is offering a special deal just for our listeners. Subscribe at topic.com and get 50% off your first two months with code RAIN. Save $12 now at Topic.com when you sign up with the code RAIN. This episode originally aired on our Patreon. We will be back with brand new episodes soon. Thank you for your patience as Josh heals from heart surgery. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. Sixteen-year-old Cassie Jo Stoddart was dropped off at the home of Allison and Frank Contreras, her aunt and uncle, in the middle-class suburban Whispering Cliffs neighborhood in Pocatello, Idaho. Her mother Anna had taken her on the 15-minute drive, dropping her off around 5.30 p.m. on September 22, 2006. It was a large, split-level home set on nearly two secluded acres, and Cassie was there to care for the family pets as she house-sat through Sunday while the Contreras' were away. Shortly after Cassie settled in, her boyfriend, Matthew Beckham, also a sophomore, showed up to hang out and watch a movie until his curfew at 11 p.m., when his mother would return to pick him up. Friends from school, Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik, both 16, then arrived. They had called Matt, and he had invited them over. Unaware of the additional parties, as well as taking her duties very seriously, their arrival annoyed Cassie. Besides being surprised, Cassie knew the guys, but wasn't as close to them as Matt. Giving a tour, the boys spent some time in the basement admiring the extensive video collection. Brian was more into horror, so he voted to watch the absolutely terrible thriller Domestic Disturbance starring John Travolta and Vince Vaughn, but he was outvoted, and the others decided on Kill Bill Volume 2 instead. Getting bored hanging out watching a movie they'd seen before, along with their friends' obnoxious sporadic makeout sessions, Brian and Tori decided to go to a local theater to catch a movie. 
It was at 9.30 p.m. when they left. First planning to see the Adam Sandler sad magic remote control comedy classic Click, but instead chose the terribly dour and boring Pulse, starring Kristen Bell. Not much changed after the guys left. The couple continued to enjoy the benefits of house-sitting while the movie played on in the background. Suddenly, the power went out. Matt headed toward the basement looking for a breaker box, but before he could even reach the stairs, the power returned. Back to the couch with Cassie, Matt assured her nothing was wrong. It simply must have been the weather or a fluke with the electrical system. With the power issue dismissed, the canoodling resumed, and they somehow remained unfazed when the family dog began growling at the basement door. Eleven o'clock rolled around, and Matt's mom arrived to pick him up. Explaining the issues with the power and how uneasy Cassie was feeling, he asked if he could just stay with her. There was no way that was going to fly, but she did offer to let Cassie stay at their place and get dropped off in the morning. But Cassie was serious about showing responsibility when it came to the expectations her family had of her watching the house. Not feeling comfortable leaving the animals, Cassie refused. She made a commitment. Matt and his mother pulled away, leaving Cassie alone in the house. Getting back inside and distracting herself from her fear with television, it wasn't long before the power went out again, and then came back on, then off, on, off. If a neighbor had been across the street, the light show might have caught their attention. But Cassie was alone though not entirely. On Sunday evening, the 24th of September, her aunt and uncle returned home, along with Cassie's 13-year-old cousin, Kelsey. Reaching the door first, Kelsey noticed it was unlocked. Entering the house as her parents unpacked the vehicle, Kelsey discovered Cassie's body on the floor in the living room. She had been stabbed to death, with 29 stab wounds identified during the autopsy. Between 9 and 12 were determined to be fatal, and several appeared as nicks, possibly hesitation wounds. The pets that had kept Cassie in the house were found unharmed, locked in another room of the house. Investigators found there was nothing missing from the house, making it pretty clear it was not a robbery. Case agent Andy Thomas and Idaho State Police Detective John Gansky interviewed Matthew Beckham, Cassie's boyfriend. He agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed, after which he was no longer considered a suspect. On September 27, 2006, five days after the killing, Brian Draper went to the police station to take a polygraph in what would be his second interview. Both he and Tori had been questioned about the events of the 22nd, the night they had been at the house with Cassie. They told their story about the movie and the makeout, both agreeing they left at 9.30 to see a movie. The issue with that alibi? Well, before interviewing Tori and Brian for the second time, Detectives Gansky and Thomas went to a theater and sat through Pulse. I'm sure taking detailed notes for what is, again, an ugly and boring product of the Weinsteins don't even get me started. Anyways... Pulse sucks, and it's pretty funny they had to absorb it. The end. (laughs) So, armed with the plot, officers asked specific details about Pulse, and neither suspect could remember a single accurate detail about the film's actors or plot points, nor how many people were in the theater that night. But how could one forget characters putting red duct tape on their windows to slightly delay the technology ghost from getting to, and I assume boring them to death? 45 minutes into the interview, the detectives changed their tone. While they had been playing good cop, confused cop, getting to know Brian better and hoping to make him feel comfortable to talk, once he had dug himself into the hole of clearly having not seen the movie, they began contradicting Brian's statements. They knew he wasn't at the theater and needed to know where they had been. Even when Brian pushed back, continuing to lie, he must have known the detectives knew he didn't have ticket stubs, that he didn't know the movie even though they claimed to be movie buffs, and their classmate, who happened to work at the theater that night, hadn't seen them come in. And she would have noticed. She was the ticket taker. Tori was interviewed the next day, also his second time speaking with police. He gave the same story as Brian about going to the movies and also told detectives that on the 21st, the day before the murder, he had found out from Cassie she would be house-sitting. Once the officers laid it out with each boy, informing them of their own unfortunate viewing of Pulse, both boys changed their stories. The detectives were right. They had lied about going to the movie. That's because it was their alibi for what they were really doing, driving around, going through unlocked cars somewhere. As questioning continued, Brian admitted to having an obsession with the Columbine High School shooting and thus became friends with like-minded students, such as Tori. The boys had met that year, their sophomore one, and had only been friends for six weeks before Cassie's murder. Brian admitted he had a crush on Cassie. She'd started dating a guy at school, Matt Beckham, which made Brian jealous. It didn't help that while on the house-sitting tour, Matt pointed out an open condom wrapper in the toilet alluding to relations he and Cassie had had at the house. He also stated that at some point before the killing, 
Tori said it would be cool to kill someone the way it had been shown in the movie Scream, specifically the unforgettable, shocking opening scene with Drew Barrymore. In his interview, Tori admitted to hating Matt Beckham in their previous year of school, and to also having a crush on Cassie, something Brian was noticeably shocked to find out from police during his second interview. Tori spoke with police the day after their conversation with Brian. He claimed, as Brian had, that after they left the house at 9.30, they drove around the neighborhood in Tori's red Geo, looking for unlocked cars to burglarize, which turned out to be a lie. But I wonder how close to true that detail is. Had the boys started stealing from cars as part of the buildup to the murder, maybe as a way to gain the composure to go through with the murder by starting small? At one hour and 26 minutes into questioning, the detectives once again shifted the focus of the interview and began to call out the conflicting information Tori had provided. The first conflict? Witnesses. At times when both teens said they were at the movies, a passing trucker had seen the red Geo parked on the road behind the house, and a clerk at a common sense convenience store remembered them coming into the store to buy matches. It had only been five days since the murder, but Brian cracked under the pressure. Confessing, he escorted detectives to an area in Black Rock, 15 miles from the murder site. Pointing to a spot on the ground that had been recently turned, police began to unearth a nightmare. This was where the boys had buried their evidence. Among the dirt and grass, detectives found knives, painted white masks detailed with fake dripping blood, and a videotape. Detectives were hopeful the tape would provide answers as to who killed Cassie, which they already had a good idea of, and the equally confounding why Cassie was killed. They got more than they expected. They played the video, which conveniently featured a time and date stamp throughout. At 8.36 p.m. on September 21, 2006, the video begins, showing a view through a windshield of a car going down the road. Two voices are present, one Brian's, the other Tory's. With giddy delight, they squeal to one another that a girl they had initially wanted to kill that night had not been home, and that instead, Cassie would be their victim. Brian is captured saying, quote, She'll be in a big dark house in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I'm sorry, Cassie's family, but she had to be the one. And this was on the same day Tori learned that Cassie would be house sitting. The next video. It's the 22nd. It's 8.29 a.m., and the setting is their high school. Brian is recording by himself in a hallway, and he stops to chat with Cassie, who is at her locker, getting ready to start what would be her final school day. Later in the day, at 12.11 p.m., Brian and Tori are shown sitting at a table, looking directly at the camera. They've skipped fourth period so they can get to writing their murder plan. Both are jokey, giddy, arrogant, and seemingly delighted at the events that lay ahead of them. Then, the night comes. In another portion of the video, it is 9.54 p.m. Back in the car, the boys have just left the house under the guise of going to the movie, but instead they'd driven down the street where the car would be spotted by a witness. The video then shows the boys back in the car at 11.32 p.m. Tori is driving and Brian is filming. Their tone has changed from excitement to mania. They are winded and nearly screaming as they speak, both in disbelief that they had done it. They had just killed Cassie. After Brian folded, Tori was confronted with the discovery of the buried evidence. When asked to finally tell the truth, he asked to speak with an attorney. In the interview footage, after he has asked for an attorney, but before he has spoken with them, he can be heard taking a deep breath, placing his hands on the top of his head and saying, quote, Okay, it all happened so fast, before one of the interrogators stops him, saying they can talk about it after the attorney arrives. When his attorney does arrive, Tori learns that Brian has confessed. In interviews recorded on September 28th and 29th, Brian, now in police custody, gave detectives a thorough description of Cassie Jo Stoddart's murder, stating that they had not filmed the crime as holding a camera would limit the ability to commit the murder. He later confessed to stabbing Cassie only once and in the leg. Charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, their cases went to trial. Once there, each said they thought they were merely going to record them prank-scaring Cassie, and the other one escalated to violence and actually committed the murder. The recovered video evidence showed the most premeditation I have ever seen, and witness statements made by their classmates detailed that Tori was obsessed with horror films and even took down notes while watching them, writing down tips on how to get away with murder. Psychological testing showed Tori as being immature for his age and exhibiting frontal lobe immaturity, which is commonly the result of a head injury, though I didn't see any mention of one. Similar to so many other cases, the killer or killers seemed to consider every minute detail leading up to and committing the murder, and then gave very little to no thought about the moves they would need to make afterward. 
Besides the evidence of them having gone to the house, having eyewitnesses place them near the house, their phones pinging by the house at the time of the murder, their lack of knowledge about Pulse, no stubs and no witnesses at the theater, there was the tape. Truly one of the most upsetting things I've ever seen. A tape where they freely and more than gladly planned and then admitted to murder. Both teens were convicted on June 8, 2007. Brian Draper was convicted of first-degree murder and received a life sentence with no possibility for parole. Tori Adamchik was also sentenced to life without parole, convicted of both first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. As part of my research, I watched a documentary called Lost for Life, which focuses on several inmates sentenced to life in prison for murders they committed as teenagers. Due to the content, it's a tough watch throughout, featuring many powerful moments displaying the effects of trauma. But there are also several moments when both Draper and Adamchik, now adults, continue to point to the other as the instigator of the crime. I believe they participated in the documentary to improve their chances at receiving new-slash-vacated sentences, but they were both unable to reach the point of assuming total responsibility for the parts they each played, which makes it difficult to believe in their rehabilitation. In 2012, mandatory life sentences without parole were banned by the U.S. Supreme Court. It is now up to the lower courts in each state to make that decision. In July of 2015, Cassie's mother, Anna Stoddart, was quoted in an Idaho State Journal article while attending a hearing regarding a request by Tori Adamchik to receive a new sentence and have his murder conviction vacated. Quote, it's just ridiculous. The parents need to get over their denial, realize that Tori did it, and he's going to spend the rest of his life in jail, and he should. They still have their son. I have to visit my daughter in the cemetery. I didn't get to see her graduate or get married or have babies. Anna Stoddard also said the only contact she has had with the Adam Chicks since Cassie's murder was a call from Dr. Phil McGraw asking if she would be interested in appearing on his daytime show with Shannon Adam Chick. Anna declined to appear. In 2016, on the 10 year anniversary of Cassie's murder, her brother Andrew, younger by one year when she was murdered, spoke with Shelby Harris of the Idaho State Journal. And I'll be quoting a portion of the article here. When the stabbing happened, Andrew was staying the night at a friend's house. He was 15 and didn't have a license at the time. Quote, I was trying to get a hold of my mom but couldn't, he said. I wasn't sure what was going on. Eventually my friend's parents gave me a ride home, but nobody was there. They were all up at the house where it happened. Both Tori and Brian are serving their life sentences in different Idaho prisons. Over the years, they have both requested to have their sentences vacated and to receive new sentences, ones with the potential for parole. The latest attempt by Tori Adamchik in 2017 was denied as all of their previous separate requests had been. Near the end of the documentary Lost for Life, Brian shows his scars from cutting, saying, quote, And now it's like the only thing I can do is hurt myself. It takes away the pain of just knowing what I did. She wasn't screaming, but in my head I could hear that. In my memories I have she's screaming. I relate to Brian and Tori, as odd as that feels to say. I felt like an outsider my whole life. I was adopted, like Brian. I grew up introverted and anxious and retreated further and further into myself just to survive grade school, then high school. I had only a couple of friends and I was a lonely kid, obsessed with horror movies, violent video games, and of course, Face Off, which is not at all as travolting as domestic disturbance. And I know this is a hairpin turn story-wise, but I also endured sexual abuse as a child. A secret I've told to only a few people over the course of my life, and one from which I may have suffered the most. And I, I, there's no detail. I didn't read any detail about that happening to either of them. I just felt like the fact that I felt this relation to them, that if I was going to talk about myself, I needed to kind of say kind of everything. So, for example, my enduring secret left me afraid of my home phone any time it rang, because I was convinced the person on the other end would tell my mom what had happened to me. I'm 42 and I still flinch when a landline phone rings. These things don't go away on their own, and some will always be with me. I never had dangerous thoughts, never had a compulsion to hurt anyone but myself, and I look back now at my teenage self and I think I got really lucky. I felt scared, pointless, and completely unnoticed. But after graduating high school and aging into adulthood, my social sphere expanded, I was well regarded in my group of friends, and I finally had a girlfriend though it only lasted a few weeks. Jennifer. <laughs> How dare you, Jennifer. Jennifer. But I never spoke up about my anxiety, the depression, or the harmful thoughts I battled daily, 
So they lived inside me, slowly wreaking havoc. I was lost and I coped by drinking a lot for a long time and began believing I was truly worthless and didn't deserve a good life or to be happy, that I should suffer and hate myself while doing it. I descended for many years after that before finally coming to terms with my mental health issues. I reflect on that and cannot believe I am still alive. I was never able to ask for help, but one day, a handful of years ago, an ex-partner helped me save my life by telling me she didn't know how much longer she could be with me if I didn't address my issues. Her honesty and fear for me helped me see for the first time how unwell I had become. In the light of that, I sought help And over time, through counseling and some delightful medication, I have been able to strike a balance in life between the dark and the light. Where thoughts of self-harm and worthlessness were once dominant in my mind, sapping me of so much energy and hope, they are now little whispers, always heard, always noted, and always passing through, never setting up camp. I'm grateful for that, and for all the goodness that has bloomed in my life as a result of getting healthier and continuing to work on myself. The story of Brian and Tori and their murder of Cassie Jo Stoddard forced reflection on me. It was startling to see so much of myself through these killers because it made me see how close to the edge I had been as a teen. I had a similar formula inside of me, but it didn't combust. Like I had the Mentos dangling over the Diet Coke, but someone knocked them out of my hand before I could drop them. Throughout the research and writing of this case, I have developed a strong, though constantly wavering, sense of empathy toward Brian Draper and Tori Adamchik, and I have no idea what to do with that feeling. Everyone needs help to shoulder the weight of their lives. It is a necessary component of living. So if you feel that you need help, reach out to a friend, a family member, a coworker, even a stranger. I feel like almost everyone can relate to some of these negative thoughts and feelings and often just can't speak them aloud. You are not alone. You can also call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at one 800 273 8255, or go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org. In the United States, they provide free and confidential emotional support to people in distress 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And if you know someone who needs help, try talking with them. It is a difficult conversation, but it could save a life. I could help save mine. For many people, summertime means travel time. Whether you're going abroad or staying domestic and want to immerse yourself in the culture, now is the perfect time to start Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that has sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, there is still time to learn a new language before you reach your destination. I started using Babbel a month ago to learn Spanish. I ended up choosing it because Spanish is spoken in 21 countries and your girl likes to travel. Even if I'm not going anywhere international for a while, I can get myself prepared. Babbel is a great way to learn Spanish or any of their 14 offered languages, including French, Italian, German, and more. Their 15-minute lessons make it the perfect way to learn a new language on the go. Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts, and their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. Plus, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, save up to 60% off of your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash rain. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash rain for up to 60% off of your subscription. Babbel, language Language for for life. We're all in a moment asking big questions, especially about work. Should I stay or should I go? Are my skills right for this job? Should I pursue my passion? These are just some of the many questions award-winning author, founder, and podcaster Jonathan Fields explores in the Sparked Podcast, presented by LinkedIn. Every week on the Sparked Podcast, a listener shares what's going on in their work and personal lives, then poses a question to Jonathan and the Sparked Brain Trust. Then the Sparked team dives in, sharing unique insights, resources, and strategies. 
The episode that really resonated with me was titled How to Bring a Writing Passion Project to Life. In this episode, we hear Bree tell her story about how life took a major change when her husband stepped back from a full-time job to focus on his mental health, and she went from a stay-at-home mom to leadership in the workforce. She has the burning desire to write two books, and the Spark podcast team helps her understand how she can balance projects at work with projects of passion. Jonathan Fields is also the executive producer and host of the top-ranked Good Life Project podcast, author of the best-selling book Spark, and creator of the Sparkotype Assessment, the global phenom that's helped over 700,000 people discover what kind of work makes them come alive. I love taking quizzes, from a silly online quiz about who wore it best to personality quizzes that help me get to know myself better. So when I heard about the Sparkotype assessment, I had to try it. And this may not surprise those of you who have to put up with me regularly, but my primary Sparkotype is the Maven. The Maven likes to dive deep into topics rather than just learn about the surface level stuff. And they like to become experts at the topic at hand. Knowing this about myself aligns really well with both my career and my passions, and it makes a lot of sense. If you're curious about what kind of work would make you come alive, take the free Sparkotype assessment and listen to the Spark podcast. If you want more from your work and life, and who doesn't these days, you have got to check out the Sparked podcast. Just look for Sparked with Jonathan Fields on your favorite podcast app today. When do we have male voices, especially, mm-hmm. willingly talk about that kind of thing? Absolutely. Openly. It's so frowned upon in society mm-hmm. that it's very, very rare. Yeah. Well, it goes back to, like we said with the guys, of like, you know, not that they should have come up with an alibi to try to hide more, but when I was watching the interrogation tapes and stuff and I was like, why didn't they just say? Because then you don't, it's kind of like for girls where it's like, I was on my period. You don't ask questions. Yeah. If you said... Oh, we actually like we're well, fooling They may around, not have you know? even had the ability to their minds to go to that, though. Oh, for sure. But I just mean even that to protect themselves, they weren't willing to go. You know yeah. what I mean? So th- that's with him speaking up. It's like that doesn't make that doesn't make him less of a man. It doesn't change his identity or Mm-mm. sexuality or anything like that of whatever uh, his instance was. But I do you think know? it's like they people feel alone, but. It's hardly ever that something has only happened once, right? Right. In yeah. anything, statistically. Mm-hmm. So the more we can get people realizing that other people experience that mm-hmm. stuff, the more comfortable they are going to someone for help. Yeah. I found it very interesting how quickly they turned on each other. Mm-hmm. And I will say because if I ever were to murder someone with another person, that would be the most important part is what happens after the murder. Like, wouldn't you want to make sure you would never turn on each other? Well, doesn't that speak to their 15 year old brain? Yeah, that's a good point. You know, Josh had mentioned because there is that scene where they're sitting at the table like, hey, guys, we're going to do this thing. And sorry, we've got our murder list. And, and they so were hyping each other. up. Yeah. And so it's like they got so into the role play almost the movie, the of LARPing. It all. Yeah. the mo- I mean, they really are. Uh, the kid Matthew and, and Skeet. Yeah. I mean, they they are those. But guys. with the excitement of the friend that loves the movies. Yeah. What's his character's name? Oh, Stu. yeah. Randy. No. Randy. Randy. What? Yeah. Stu. Billy and Stu are the killer. killers. Oh, right, right, right. It's like their thinking did just stop at like get to the house and stab her. And then it was over. But and then they get into the car and he, the one kid goes, I killed her. I did it. And then the others like shut the fuck up. Yeah. We got to get our act straight. Yeah, it's that was very interesting yeah. and telling. Yeah, it was Brian. Brian, he said that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I understand the empathy. And I think that's a conversation that doesn't happen very often of empathy towards the perpetrator because it's it's the most taboo and it's unallowed. But it's like yeah. we're talking about 16 year old kids who not only might have had brain damage, were 10 years away from their brains being fully developed. But then you turn around and say, well, I was a teenager and I had and angst I wouldn't issues have done that. and I didn't do that. I didn't think about doing that. So and, and also it's not like it was a crime of passion. Mm-hmm. It was so detailed was and, and obsessed over for years, I yeah. imagine. And uh, and right. knowing what that would be, they weren't like, oh, wait, she's dead. I think we've run into it a few times where we do have this almost surprising empathy mm-hmm. towards the perpetrator. And it usually is the teen teen boys. Yeah, because that's mostly what we cover. Right. 
But even even in the teenage girl ones, um, I covered that case long ago. One of our, oh, my first yeah. cases about the Michelle Gates, mm-hmm. and you you empathize easily with someone whose life is ahead of them mm-hmm. who made a mistake, and then you find out she'd done it before and right it, planning and well, and I think to Josh's point, we all have that combination. It doesn't take dark a lot and of light. yeah, it doesn't take a lot of missteps in life to send you down a really dark path or spiral you into mental health issues. And Josh said it himself, like he feels lucky to be alive. Uh, There are people who have been in such a dark place that could have been them. Right. It could have easily been them. We have actually that's Oregon has a few cases. So they call them the Oregon Five. Mm -hmm. And it was five teenage boys who were who all had first degree murder. And it was in the media forever and the courts kept going back and forth on do you put them in life no right. parole that's not fair like they could be rehabilitated it's and some have one of them is still in prison and actually he's the one where you're like how is he not out yet oh he right. does so much good he, I, i'm sorry i forgot his name i think i'm going to cover his case in a few weeks but he has started an organization to help other boys teenage boys oh, in wow. the prison system Yet he's the one that's still in prison, still in jail, hasn't gone up for parole. It, so it's a little interesting that some of what they're doing is working on someone, mm-hmm. and yet he's still back behind bars. And how do you know? How do you look at that and go? Good point. Um, you know, because we've also covered cases many times where, um, and I, I'm blanking the most recent one where it's like, is that guy really wanting to help other convicts, or oh, Engweiler? Yes. Yeah. Or is he just wanting to? you know, present himself as a certain way. And so you think about it with these kids and go, so they only had 15, 16 years outside of jail. They've now had that same amount of time in prison. And prison, as we've discussed, is not a place for rehabilitation. Yeah. Yeah. At at what point do you decide? Does it mean that they have to take full responsibility and like explain everything? I'm a believer in actions, though. Like you can say your change... Right. With so many words and you can be intelligent and well spoken. But there are people in there watching you every single day. What are you doing every day to better yourself? Are you counseling other people? Are you leading group where you guys are sharing your feelings and talking about what you're going to do if you do get parole? Like, are you getting an education? So I think there are some things that help kind of paint that whole picture of these people are being rehabilitated. But Engweiler is a perfect example. He does seem to be doing things on paper, yet, you know, he didn't go to he didn't go to counseling like he said he was going to. And yeah, he's just got that something about him that you Mm -hmm. think he's lying. And it's such a gamble. I mean, it's taking them into the real world. What does that look like to say, "Okay, please don't kill anyone. Please don't hurt anyone. Hope for the best. Like, that's such a scary gamble. But then you turn around. And how many times do we talk about things where it's like, oh, they misfiled a piece of paper and the guy got out or he was paroled because he like winked at somebody. And you're just like, and then this other guy from the five who's doing things and you're like, why isn't he? (laughs) Alan, think if their brains aren't done developing and they're doing that end of their development in prison. What does that mean to the human brain? Have we even given them a chance to do anything but fail? Speaking to that development point. There was a call from between Brian and his mom and when he was first arrested and the whole time she's asking the questions like why. He's only asking when can I come home? When can I come home? Because he I doesn't understand. Yeah. He has no idea the gravity of it. Yeah. Wow. Knows what he did. Knows he killed her. Knows that's wrong but doesn't understand. It's like it. he yeah. almost thinks it's a forgivable thing like it, it really wasn't real. It's like um that teenage invincibility yeah. where it's like there your brain can't think f- forever and so you don't have a concept of something being finite or uh, the repercussions being yeah. instantaneous. That's incredibly sad. Yeah. Just. And was he the one with the possible brain damage? Tori was. I don't oh, Tori yeah. was. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, what is that from? They didn't say. They just said that he had it. And, and maybe it, he and hit his head as a kid. I that is brain. So, yeah. 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 They yeah said, brain I mean, it's like the most common yeah, exactly. uh, cause of that. Yeah. Uh, my brain, I can't help but wonder, you know, I've had students that were TBI, a uh, traumatic brain injury from uh, like shaken baby syndrome and you know there were aggression issues not always that's not like uh, something that always is present with that but it kind of makes you wonder why the why the draw to horror movies was there some sort of additional abuse in the household maybe even when he was a baby and that's how he got that you know that's 
that's the path my brain goes down. But yeah, it's a tough one. I don't know how comfortable if someone said we're letting these two guys out. Yeah, at, I don't know. At 30 something years old, I don't know how well, comfortable. And like I'd I was be. saying in the script too, that like they both are still not taking culpability for right. it. They're both shifting and to that, the other they'll guy. They'll never get parole if they can. Exactly. That. Yeah. So like Brian Brian is a little more on the side of 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 apologizing and and accepting it sort of. And Tori and his parents are both completely on the denial train. Wow. That Tori was just kind of taken his along parents? for the ride. Oh yeah. Didn't his mom like write a book or something? His mom wrote a book that's very skewed and I didn't read it. I didn't buy it because I didn't Ugh. feel comfortable giving her money. But the the reviews that I saw are just that it is it is pretty toxic Maybe and pretty clear she's you know it kind might of... be free on scribed i'll look it up oh yeah please, yeah i'd be curious to hear what the, um what that, it was like but yeah that i i get that it's your baby yeah. that's your child but that's hard to handle like you gotta accept it nobody's gonna heal and i feel like there are times it. unless it's um a, a case that you think your child's been wrongfully convicted i feel like the respectful thing to do too is like you just step back you know like the parents to, yeah to yeah. not fight against what what is known to have happened for the sake of Cassie's family. There's a there's a moment too in, in, in one of the videos when Tori's being interviewed and his parents are in the room with police as it's happening and his mother tries to corroborate a lie for him about a, oh, a stolen CD case. And in the moment, Tori, you can see him trying to like it, indicate to her not to do that because he it's like he doesn't want her to get caught up in his lies. Right. But I mean, it seems like she's more than happy to have done that and to continue. Oh, and man. you you can't help but wonder too at that young age, in a very heightened state. I mean, I don't know if you can get more adrenaline than doing something like that. You know, can are they able to apologize? Because does their brain even remember it uh, in the in the realm of reality? Oh, accurately, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if I killed. Well, not, memory, that, not that they blacked memory out. Self but... is selective and and usually inaccurate yeah to some and it's like so if you grab you know maybe they grabbed a, a, a moment of that and they're just replaying it and over the years it just molds into something else and it's like well how can i apologize so from my do it. understanding tori is basically saying he only stabbed her once in the leg brian's the instigator brian's the one that murdered i'm along for the ride is that like the argument no uh brian said that he was the oh. one that only i don't know what tori said but i know that brian i didn't uh but that brian said he only did it once and with the exception Brian's of the, in the car. video that yeah. says i killed her yes how interesting because yeah. it would make sense if tori's family believed that if you know there are cases where it was two teenage boys mm -hmm. that committed a murder um jamie jamie uh burglar is that his but oh gosh that british little boy that oh, was murdered right the two boys one was the primary instigator right. and the other one was like, I, you know, I'm, I got to mm -hmm. do it to be with him. So that happens quite often, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, I think there's always a power dynamic within that kind of relationship. But yeah, this but one, we're left wondering who's, who is it in this case? This one, they're just, you don't see that separation as much. Yeah. You just see like, they yeah, both you both it. just now attacked her. The thing that stuck out to me that I kept thinking about nearly that entire time until you dropped that bomb on us was when you said, they had planned another girl and that didn't work out. A, do you think they know who that was? And does that girl know that she could have died that night? I think mm. so. I saw in one of the videos and it had like transcripts over it. Uh, they identified her as Jane Doe one. OK, so I assume they know that the that, you know, police knew and who she that was, was probably interviewed. She was interviewed. And I know the, yeah, that they went there. She was, I think, at church or something that evening. And I don't know if no one was home or if it was just that she wasn't home. Wow. That they decided not to. And then they, they, he already knew about Cassie staying at the house and that was it. What a close call. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, yeah. And just the coldness with which they make that decision is just like, is, I mean, it's just so, it's just so fucking disturbing. Jesus. And six weeks. That's only like New Year's to Valentine's Day. You know, that's not, that's less time than that. That's like no time to, know someone that's just so to upsetting commit to something like, to, yeah like to that. just be yeah. that intense with someone it's like, any kind of energy like that you know the people we met at a bar and we got how engaged does that begin? night how does that come up yes i wonder that all the while time while watching like, a horror movie yeah probably or like oh that'd be fun to do or something sick and yeah just can't just, fathom it and then to just be caught up in that whirlwind and take a life and lose your own i can see where the empathy comes in yeah me too. but it's hard to have any when so much of it should go to Cassie and her family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, the video in the morning 
it's they know like they go out of their way to find her and, and they film her at her locker and she's you know a beautiful young girl and yeah that sort of you stuff can tell to how me, they're filming her and they know that they know their plan it seems that sort of behavior that they exhibit to me to me seems uh fundamental to who they are yeah uh, even you know then and I, they're older now if i imagine i mean i think still now that's i don't know I can't imagine something like that changing by, about someone. Yeah. But I don't I don't know. Bye. No one does. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. I don't either. I it's honestly a, don't. It was is it it was just it was a tough story to it was it the writing process took me a lot longer because it is it, it became Hard more complex process. as I as I researched more and I've, more. Yeah. I've run into cases yeah. like that where I I did that with Halloween. I needed a break cuz it was just so I felt so much empathy to so many people. It was hard. Yeah. yeah. And there is no answer. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's just what happened. Yeah. It's like, oh, but there's closure because there's justice. And it's like, ugh. not for the not for her family. No. Yeah. How do you um, validate or show rehabilitation without inspiring other kids that watch things? To be like, it'll be fine, or disrespecting the family of the victim. Yeah. That's the tightrope we try to walk. <laughs> exactly. Oh! <laughs> Is that you falling off the tightrope? Obviously. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. All right. there to care for the family pets as she house sat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was so accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Friends from Scroll. Scroll. <laughs> Friends from Scroll. These are my friends from Scroll. <laughs> Is that porn star school? Porn star school? Scroll. 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 Yes. I get it. Screw. <laughs> Scroll. <laughs> I learned fellatio at scroll. Exactly, yes. <laughs> but I hate men. <laughs> <laughs> Friends from scroll. Scroll. <laughs> no, it's oh, just no, permanent. Oh no, you're stuck. Detective jewelry went to scroll. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, we're a bunch of kidders. Little silly gooses, <laughs> three scams. of us. Quack, quack. <laughs> honk, honk. Quack, quack. <laughs> Three silly gooses, quack, quack. I've never heard that before. <laughs> honk, 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 honk. My bad. Wet my whistle. Oh. Ew, I don't like that scene. <laughs> Can't you hear how wet it is now? <laughs> oh, God, kill me. That's a wet whistle. <laughs> I don't recall any head injuries until adulthood, but oh, I've seen one on yeah. video of yours. Yeah, I had a that one's a rough one. That's why my passwords have to always be the same thing. <laughs> Ow! Oh! Oh! <laughs> wow, you saved the I water, saved the which water. saved the show. Holy shit! Wow. Whatever it would have would have shorted out the chip, and then we have like, we would, and we'd also have to redo files. that fucking case. Yeah, no <laughs> Poor John. Right, okay, bring that same level of emotion, okay? <laughs> Make it organic. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough, edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs> <laughs>